But, you know, we live in the greatest country in the whole world. The greatest country in the whole world. Canada, the United States, two greatest countries in the whole world. And every day when we get out of, out of bed, we have a rendezvous with the destiny of America's greatness. The opportunity that we have every single day. You saw those videos before. You know, it's everything. Every, think of all the people who come to America just for their medical treatments and education and everything. Did you come out here on an airplane? I did. It was made in Seattle, Washington. Were you on the interstate highway system to get here? I was. Do you know when Dwight Eisenhower started the interstate highway system? In 1957, it soon became the largest public works project in the world, and it still is. America's interstate highway system. So everything is great. And I said, you know, people come here for their medical treatment. Now, not everything runs as smoothly as we, we like it. I had an earache last week. And the only thing worse than an earache is an earache on an airplane. And I knew I was coming out to visit with you folks. And so I went to see my doctor. And the, she has a, my doctor has a new office manager. And she said, OK, you go into this room over here and undress. And then you go, to, that's the dressing room. Then you go over to this room over here, which is the treatment room. And I said, I have an earache. She said, I'm in charge. Now you go in there and get your clothes off. I said, OK. So I went in there, and I'm taking my clothes off. And another guy comes in. And he's taking his clothes off. And I said, this is just as silly as hell. Isn't it? I'm here for an earache. He said, you're lucky. I'm here for the, to fix a Xerox machine. <laughs> but America is the greatest country in the whole world. You know, there's no folks building, you know, building leaky boats trying to sneak into Cuba. There's no folks trying to get out of Texas into Mexico. Everybody's coming to America. And so as I said, Everything, you know, the iron workers who put this building together and the iron workers who put all the buildings across Canada and America together, though that's a symbol of America's greatness. As I said, the airplane that I rode out here on and everything, and I brought another symbol of America's greatness with me today, a lava lamp. Now, you might be saying to yourself, why does he think a lava lamp is a symbol of America's greatness? And I'll tell you why. A child was born in Harvey, North Dakota in 1916. Who here has been to Harvey, North Dakota? I right, let's do it this way. Who knows North Dakota's a state now? <laughs> so this child was born in, in 1916 in Harvey, North Dakota. And 18 years later, he was a senior in high school. That was 1934. In 1934, America was still in the grips of the Great Depression. And this kid didn't have any money, and he didn't know anybody had any money. There were no federally guaranteed loans in those days. His parents didn't have any money. It's a teeny little wide spot in the road in rural North Dakota, and he and his buddies were sitting around one day, and he says, well, I guess we're not going to go to college. But the guy I'm talking about said, wait a minute. This is America. This is the greatest country in the whole world. This is a country, if you want to use your back and use your brain, and play by the rules and work hard, dreams can come true in America, the land of opportunity. So he took a year off. He lived with his parents so he had no living expenses. Took every odd job he could and put every nickel he made into the bank. And he got enough money, not for his tuition, but for the down payment on his tuition. So he went off to college, and he graduated number two in his class. Took him five years to get through. Now, how come a guy who graduates number two in his class took, took five years to get through? Because he had to work 12 months a year. He had a, he had a, a job in a semi line at a factory. And every semester, he had to balance what shifts were available at the factory with what his class schedule was. So he worked 12 months a year, and he went to school 12 months a year, and graduated number two in his class in five years. Well, when you get out of college, you think about your career, and you think about a family. He had a very unusual career and a very unusual family. Let me tell you about it. At age 34, excuse me, at age 43, he was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. At age 40, there's only 500 of these people, and at age 43, he became, remember, work hard, use your back, use your brain, play by the rules. He became the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And that company made uh, radios and televisions and tape recorders and record players and all the consumer appliances of the day. And this was the 60s now. The company's based in Chicago. And this was the 60s, and America was going through uh, an age of affluence. 
And also color television was becoming very, very popular, very commonplace. And the three networks were having almost all their programming switch to color TV. And so this fellow who was in the television business said, well, I need to build a factory just to build color televisions. So he contacted governors from various states and said, I'd like to, to build this, this factory, which will be you know, X amount of um, iron worker and other construction jobs, and then Y amount of permanent jobs. Well, of course, the governors come rushing to his office, and they say, build it in my state, build it in my state. And the guy, the CEO of the company, does his due diligence and figures out the best place to go is to Arkansas. Now, this is 1966. The Civil Rights Act passed in 1964, and this is 1966. So the governor of Arkansas in 1966 was a guy named Orville Faubus. Now, then in 1964, the Civil Rights Act passed, and the southern states had what they call massive resistance. They said, we don't care what, what Washington does. We're going to do our own thing. So they're going to announce the, the uh, opening of this factory, and the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, and the CEO of this company have the shovels, you know, they have the, the golden shovels, and they're going to turn the first spade of dirt, and it's going to symbolic, and the media is going to be there, and all this thing is going to, this grand opening of this building is going to create all these construction jobs temporarily and all these permanent jobs building color television sets. At noon, the ceremony is to take place. At 10 minutes of noon, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, goes rushing in to the CEO of this company and says, wait, 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 I just heard that you're, playing, you're going to pay colored folks, the term of the day, colored folks and white folks the same rate of money. I understand they're going to be using the same bathrooms and use, having lunch in the same lunchroom, and you're going to pay them the same. They're going to work alongside each other. They're going, get, they're going to get promoted based on their abilities, not on their skin color. And the CEO says, yeah, of course. And Orba Faba says, wait a second, this is Arkansas, and we don't do it that way. We have to make some adjustments, and we have to make some this, and that, that, and your people need to... And the CEO says, no, we're not, you know, we're not doing it that way. America's a first-class country. First-class countries don't have second-class citizens, and that's the way we're going to do it here. And the governor says, no, 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 see, your people got to talk to my people, and we got to make some adjustments. And the guy says, it's two minutes of 12. I'm going to go out there and announce all these jobs for iron workers and other construction trades and permanent jobs building these color television sets, or I'm going to go out there and announce because your governor is, is a bigot and an idiot, I guess that's redundant, um, I'm taking these jobs somewhere else. And the governor says, okay. And they opened the factory, and that factory is still uh, operating in, in the eastern Arkansas. Well, he had, this was a Fortune 500 company, smallish, and it was very successful. So a larger company bought the television company, and the CEO, of course, he's gone. He's out of a job. So what he said, well, what am I going to do? I've worked so hard all my life. What am I going to do now? And just then, the lava lamp company became available for sale, and he bought it. He bought the lava lamp company, and was going through a rough time but using his management skills, he nursed it back to health, and that fell on his family owned the lava lamp company for 40 years. And in the last five years of the 40 years that family owned that company, more lava lamps were made in America and consumed in the previous cumulative 35 years. So I said he had a very, very non-traditional professional life. He had a very non-traditional family life as well. He had nine children. Nine children, and they all went to private school. Let me do the math for you. Nine times eight years of elementary school, nine times four years of high school, and nine times four years of college is 144 years of private school tuition. And this fellow was in his office one day, and one of his nine children comes in, and the fellow's writing a check, or a tuition check, for another private school of tuition someplace. And the child says to his father, Dad, doesn't it make you crazy? Just crazy, see all your money go out the door every day? And the guy said, it's not my money, it's America's money. Only in America could a penniless child from a wide spot in the road in North Dakota have the, the economic opportunity 
to make television, to make lava lamps, and, and all the economic opportunity that comes with being an American. Only in America could we have an education system where all nine of my children get to go to the college of their choice that best suits their aptitudes and, in, and, and interest. So it's not my money, it's America's money, the fellow said. So that's why I brought the lava lamp along with me today, because I do think it's a symbol, just like the iron, the, the iron workers, the stuff you, the buildings that you make, the, the Boeing airplane that I came on, and all the things that, that all symbols are all products of America, the greatness of America, the opportunity that each of us have every single day, those are all symbols of the greatness of America, as is this lava lamp. The other reason I brought the lava lamp along with me today is because I'm very proud of that fellow from North Dakota because he's my father. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to turn the lava lamp off right now, and all of the lava, wax and paraffin, is going to fall to the bottom, become cold and inert. And that's what happened to your power of self-government. If you don't exercise your power of self-government, like this lava, it will fall to the bottom and be cold and inert. And it's very important that in Canada, you go to your provincial government and you go to Iowa. Ottawa. And in Washington, D.C., in America, it's important you go to your state government and you go to Washington, D.C. Because the provincial and Canadian government and the state government and the U.S. government, they are your unwanted, uninvited, but always present partner in your business. And you heard the presentation before about the political process. It's very important. You see, your elected officials in Canada or U.S., they cannot do one single thing for you if they don't know your name and know your issue. I'll repeat that. They can't do one single thing for you if they don't know your name and know your issue. And that's why you have to get involved. That's why you have to stay involved. And that's why you cannot not let your lava, your, your power of self-government fall to the bottom. And I, um, <clears throat> is Ross Templeton in here? Ross, I'm going to give you this lava lamp. It's a gift from my family. And I want you to turn the lava lamp on every day in your office. And as that lava moves, that's to remind you, Ross, to remind all of you, and for you to remind everybody else, to make sure to exercise your power of self-government. And Kevin Hilton, I got one for you, too. So it's important that you, that, that, that you do that. Now, whether you're a rod buster, or an iron head, or a welder, whoever you are, you're the GC or the end user, the government is your always, always present, uninvited partner in your business. So if you have a partner in your business, you want to control it, right? You want to control that partner, and that's very important that you do. And I'll give you a couple of examples. You see this knife? I couldn't take it on the airplane. Kathy Finch in your office sent it out with, with, with the, the supply she sent out. I can't get this on the airplane. Now, when 9-11 happened, Homeland Security said, okay, no knives. And this, this blade is an inch and a half but I can't get this on an airplane after 9-11. So about a year ago, Homeland Security said, you know what, we can allow these little knives, see how small that blade is? We can allow that, can't we? Sure, that'll be safe. That doesn't imperil anybody's safety. Well, the flight attendants union went nuts. Now in Washington, D.C., I can tell you, and the Washington, D.C. veterans will tell you, the flight attendants union is not a power broker. They're not a big force in Washington, D.C. But they sure got riled up, and so they all went to Capitol Hill. They all wore their uniforms, so they were visible. And they went to all 535 members of Congress, and they said, you know what? If you put this knife in a carotid artery, you can bleed out like in two minutes. Do not allow knives of any size on airplanes. And so the 535 members of Congress, they got the message. And, and they said to Homeland Security, no knives, no size at all. Because you know why? They were unified. You heard Eric talk about the outdated 1971 OSHA regulations. You can do the same thing. See, Congress controls everything. They control the money. They appropriate all the money. And they can say in this appropriation, none of this, not one penny of this appropriation can be used to enforce such and such. Or some of this money must be used to write or enforce or, write or regulate such and such. Congress controls everything. And who controls Congress? We do. 
We do it at the ballot box every other November. And there's other ways to control Congress. Uh, you can vote for them. You can do what my, my wife does. They, they give her like an eight or nine block area, and she goes right before the, uh, before the election campaign. She does what's called a lit drop, which is a literature drop, and she puts literature in everybody's mailbox, and she knocks on doors, and she says, vote for this candidate for this reason. And she doesn't write a check, but she contributes to the candidate of her choice. And you can write a check. You can write a check. Let's say you write a check. Send it to the candidate, your choice. How about if you take that check and put it together, with yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours, and put, them, put them all together? It's called a PAC, a political action committee. The iron workers have this terrific PAC. And while 100 checks speaks more loudly than one check, 100 contacts. Now, I used to urge people to write Congress. You can't do that anymore because um, it goes to uh, a facility way out in the suburbs of, of Washington, D.C., and they x-ray it or something to make sure there's nothing bad stuff in there. And then it has to be sent to Capitol Hill, and it has to be sorted. But you can email them. You can text them. Members of Congress are really big on social media. They love social media. Facebook and all the other platforms, they love all that stuff. They want to hear from you. You know why? Because they want you to like what they're doing. And you want to like what they're doing, but they can't help you, I'm repeating myself, if they don't know your name and they don't know what your issue is. I'll give you another example. Uh, in Illinois, the Illinois Restaurant Association was being sued by ASCAP. ASCAP is ASCPA, American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. They're the ones who own the intellectual rights to music. And you know, you go into a restaurant, and you sit in a bar, you go into a restaurant, wherever you go, and they have that background music, what my kids call elevator music. Well, ASCAP owns the, the um, intellectual property rights on that. And ASCAP said to the Illinois Restaurant Association, you're going to play our music, we want to get paid. And the Illinois Restaurant Association said, we're not making any money on that. There's no money to pay you with. So ASCAP went to the Illinois legislature, the capital of Illinois, Springfield. They went to the Illinois legislature in Springfield, and they tried to get a legislative fix. The Illinois Regist Restaurant Association had just hired a brand new executive director. And on her second day in office, she went down to Springfield, and there was a hearing in the, in the Illinois Senate on this very issue about the intellectual property and ASCAP and all that. The senator who chaired that subcommittee is her senator. She lives in his senatorial district. And so after the hearing, she goes up and said, Senator, my name is such and such, and I'm with the Illinois Restaurant Association, things like that. She says, we're very upset with this. You can't do this. There's, we don't make any money on this. We'll just turn this music off. We don't make any money. There's no money to share to pay anybody else. And the senator says, well, you and your members are very upset about this, aren't you? And she says, yes. She says, really? The senator says, really? How come nobody wrote me one single letter? Okay? They can't do anything for you unless they know who you are and what your issue is. And if you take, if you eliminate abortion and gun control or gun safety, depending on what side of the issue you're on, and immigration, those four or five hot button issues, 50 contacts is a big deal on the Senate or the House side, and in Ottawa too. 50 contacts is a big deal. And I know there's more than 50 people right in this little section right here. You can do this. You can do this, it's really easy, because they want to hear from you, because they want to do what you want them to do, so you'll say thank you at the ballot box every other November. I'll give you another, another example. There was a young lady who had some very serious, um, some very serious uh, cancer, and you know she lost her uh, ovaries and uh, everything, all her reproductive items, uh, all everything in her reproductive system, and she was very sick. And through the diagnosis process and the surgery and the recovery process, she couldn't work and she didn't have any income. She had a federally guaranteed loan, and she said, well, "Wait a minute, can't the federal government?" allow me to suspend payments interest-free on this, on this loan. And she wrote one letter to the editor of the New York Times. And then she multiplied that letter and she found other people who also had wanted to suspend, pay off their full loan, but suspended interest-free until they got back on their feet. 
And she got a group of people, and they went to all 535 members of Congress with this copy of this letter to the editor saying, these are federal loans. Certainly, when we are serious, seriously ill, you can suspend them. We'll pay them. We just need a suspension process. And last summer, last summer Donald Trump signed that legislation. You, so that was one 36-year-old woman who wrote one letter to the editor of the New York Times and then got some folks and went door to door on Capitol Hill. And they got their legislation passed. You can't do this. But you have to have a presence. You have to have a Ross Templeton. Okay? When Google first got started, somebody said, you're going to have a Washington office? And they said, no, we're not going to have a Washington office. We don't need a Washington office. We're a, we're a computer company. We have no product. We're, we're just you know, in the cyberspace. <clears throat> somebody said, no, I think you really need a Washington office. They said, no, we don't need a Washington office. Well, the Federal Election Commission every year publishes their, their records. Uh, if you're a lobby, registered lobbyist, and how much you spend on lobbying, you know who spent more money than any organization last year in Washington, D.C., on lobbying? Google. They went from we don't need an office to their number, they're the number one spender in Washington, D.C. Everybody needs a voice. Stealing a line from our friends at the lottery, it's impossible to win if you don't play. So it's important to play. It's important to be part of the process. The other thing I said, you have, to get, you have to get involved in the process. There's a multiplier effect. Let us say there's one contact, be it a letter, a text, an email, Facebook, whatever it is. Or there's 10 contacts, or there's 20 contacts, or whatever it is. Many offices on Capitol Hill, because I used to do this, it, it's a multiplier effect. You figure, well, if 10 people wrote a letter, or posted on my Facebook, or whatever, let's multiply that by 50, or by 75. Depends if you're from Wyoming or California, what the multiplier effect is. But, they say, well, if 10 people took time to send this text or this email, maybe that means there's 200 people out there. Uh, as I said, other than abortion and immigration and gun control and all that stuff, the real hot button issues, 50 contacts is considered a really big deal. This is not brain surgery. This is easy to do, and you can do it. And here's what's most important. It works. It's effective. It's important. It's also to find out which committees in Congress and in Parliament in Ottawa, which committees are important to you? And who are the chairmen of those committees? And who are the chairs of the subcommittees? Keep in mind that 99% of the work is done in a subcommittee. Because if it doesn't get out of subcommittee, it never goes to full committee, which means it never goes to the floor for the, for the full vote. 99% of the work is done in subcommittee. Who is the chair on that subcommittee? Who serves on that subcommittee? Does he or she represent you in Congress or in Parliament? It's good. It, get to know those people because they're important. They are the ones who control all the legislation. And the best thing to do is to establish an avenue of communication before you need to see them professionally. Do your kids play together on the same soccer team? Do you go to church together? Are you in the bowling league together? Establish those avenues of communication then you can use those avenues of communication when you need to see someone to talk about a, a legislative or a regulatory issue. It's very important that you do this, and it's easy to do it. Because, see, it's a trade. It's a trade. They need your votes. They need your support. And you need their, their work in subcommittee and committee, and you need, their, you need them to represent you. It's a trade. You need them. They need you. And they know they need you. And they will listen to you. And you, you can do whatever you want. It's, not, it's just not major legislation. And you heard you know, Eric talk about the 1971 outdated OSHA rules. Congress controls OSHA with its appropriations. Congress controls everything. It controls the money. It controls the money. So it's very, very important that, that you do this. The other thing is, you can't care who gets the credit. You just want your legislative and regulatory agenda achieved. You can't care who gets the credit. And I'll give you a story of, of, of how not getting, not getting, who cares and getting the credit is important. In Wisconsin, the bankers and the credit unions both had a piece of legislation in the, in the Wisconsin Senate. Of course, you know, bankers and credit unions, that's like Ford and Chevy, Coke and Pepsi. Those guys hate each other. And a member of the Wisconsin Senate looked at both pieces of bill and said, wait a second. If you look at this one, look at that one, there are four or five, th five or things in there that were the same. 
such as bankruptcy reform and having electronic signature being legal and things like that. And so that senator said, wait a second. Why don't we take these four or five things that you guys agree on, we'll put it in one bill, I can get that passed. And the bankers and the credit union said, yeah, we agree on those, we'll work together on those. And so you have to cooperate with other groups and you can't care who gets the credit. I'll give you an example of not caring who gets the credit. In the NBA, the National Basketball Association, all those teams have 12 players. Now the first five players are the starting five, and then the sixth and seventh players are the folks who go in and substitute for the starting five to give the starting five a rest from, there, from time to time. And the last five are basically the practice team for the first five. They never get on the floor. They never get on, on the floor until the outcome of the game's already been decided. In the NBA, they call that garbage time. So one of the last five severely strained his ankle. And the doctor said, you go home and don't put one ounce of weight on that ankle for an entire week. You stay off that ankle. And so the Chicago Bulls needed um, somebody to be on the practice team. So they went back and signed to a one-week contract the last guy they, caught, they cut in, in training camp. And he had a one-week contract with the NBA. And during that one week, he got into one game, and he scored two points. One basket is two points. It's the same night that Michael Jordan scored 48 points. And to this day, that fellow with the one-week contract is still talking about his career in the NBA, especially the night that he and Michael combined for 50 points. <laughs> so just like the Wisconsin Senate, the bankers and the credit unions, they didn't care who got the credit. The senator took the credit. They got what they wanted. So you have to cooperate with your other groups. Who are your allies? Who are your advocates? And don't burn any bridges because today's advocate might be tomorrow's ally. So it's very, very important. Grassroots citizen advocacy is a very important part of life. It's a very important part of self-government. And who gave us self-government? Who gave us self-government? Our heroes did. Each of us have a hero. Each of us have someone who crossed the ocean, or crossed the, the mountains, or crossed the desert, to, to come to America and come to Canada to take their dream of self-government and turn it into our birthright. All of us have somebody who did that. Let me tell you about my hero. My hero is my grandmother Sweeney, Catherine Cunningham Sweeney, stood about this tall, had a fourth grade education. At age 18, at age 18, this is in the year 1900, at age 18, she decided to come to America, to leave her native Ireland, knowing that she may never see her parents again. And as it worked out, she never did. She never saw her parents again. But at age 18, she risked it all to come to America, the land of opportunity, the land of self-government, because the Brits were horrible to the Irish. The Irish Revolution was in 1926, so all of Ireland was a British colony until 1926, and this was the year 1900. The Brits did not allow freedom of assembly. Freedom of assembly, a constitutionally protected right that we're exercising at this moment. The only time that the Brits suspended the prohibition on freedom of assemblies during Irish wakes and that's why you hear Irish wakes are loud, boisterous, party-like affairs. That's why they were loud, boisterous, party-like affairs, because that was the one time you had freedom of assembly. And the, and the British government allowed everybody to get together. And the Brits were not, didn't allow the Irish to practice, openly practice their religion. And you couldn't vote unless you owned property. It's pretty hard to own property if they don't let you go, back, go to school past fourth grade. So for those and a whole bunch of reasons, she came to America. And she rode in a boat in third class, except that it was called steerage, because that's where you were. You were in the bowels of the boat where the steering mechanism is and the engine and the muck and the muck and the noise and the grime and the dirt and all that. And I said, well, grandmother, why didn't you go up to the deck and get a little fresh air? And she said, well, the first class passengers have the deck on the bow of the boat. But the steerage passengers, third class, our deck was behind the smokestack. There's not a lot of fresh air behind the smokestack. So she stayed with everybody else in the bottom of that boat for eight days and seven nights. And when they pulled into New York Harbor, they allowed, they allowed all the third-class passengers to go up to the first-class deck, which is on the bow of the boat. 
and everybody was joyous because first of all, they were seeing land for the first time in eight days. Second, they were seeing America. And my grandmother said she was overjoyed because she had never, she was from a little fishing village in the west coast of Ireland. She had never seen a three-story building. So, if you, know, if you go to New York Harbor, if you go to the right, that's the East River. You go to the left, that's the Hudson River. And you go in the Hudson River, and what do you see? The Statue of Liberty. What's it say on the base of the Statue of Liberty? It says, give me your tired, your hungry, your poor, your yearning, teeming masses yearning to breathe free. And that's who my grandmother was, and that's who everybody else was on that boat. Because they all rushed up to the bow of the boat. And the bow of the boat was empty because all the first-class passengers were in, their cab were in their cabins packing all their belongings. All the third-class passengers were wearing all of their belongings. So you go into Ellis Island, and a non-medically non trained immigration officer would take 60 or 90 seconds to decide if you had a communicable disease or not. And if you had a communicable disease, you had to go stand in that line, which meant they were going to send you back to the tyranny for which you just escaped, or they would put you in quarantine. Or if you got to go get into America, and that's why Ellis Island is called either the Isle of Tears or the Golden Door, you got, to, you got to get into America. Well, it didn't take very long for people to figure out, well, you know, when the immigration officer is look, look, not looking, I can sneak out of that line and go over here into this, this pool over here. So the immigration officer said, well, I know how to fix that. If we put you in that line, we're going to put an X on your coat. We're going to put an X on your coat so you can't sneak over there. Our heroes are the ones who turn their dream of self-government into our birthrights. They turn their dream, they risk it all to give us the birthright of self-government. The very best thing we can do is to honor our, our heroes and to honor our countries is to take that power of self-government, use it often, and use it well. Thank you so much for inviting me to your meeting. It was my pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you.